Uh, now I try to. Okay, let's go. Okay, a uh, little bit with myself. I've been doing this now for 27, 28 years. years. I used to work for provincial government for 20 years. And uh, now I have my own consulting business. Um, so far, it's so good. We, as a business, offer a range of the services to a really variety of the, of the clients, from um, developers to the legal, regulatories, uh, residential and commercial businesses. Uh, myself, we are not a company who is going to come and prune the trees and or plant the trees for you. Uh, there is a bunch of other companies. Uh, we we are strictly a consulting company. And again, one of our clients is uh, uh, Flagstaff County. Uh, part of the services that we do, and I've been hired lately quite a bit, is uh, tree appraisal and value assessment. Uh, we, in the, uh, we have uh, some of the fires in the west side of the of the province this spring, and I, I've been now uh, hired by the insurance company to do the appraisal and damage assessment uh, to provide for the insurance. Um, I do a lot of what we call tree hazard risk assessment, uh, where you, if you have a campgrounds or anywhere that uh, you have a trees and you provide um, some services to uh, open public, uh, you might need to consider uh, to do the tree risk hazard assessment. Uh, lots of inventory for, especially for small communities. I think my my business only business who provide the tree inventory for the small towns and small urban areas. And it's very important that you do have an inventory in that sense. And I, I do lots of shelter belts and wind breaks and uh, 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 design and provide a list of tree species. And then last and not least, uh, with lots of people i got probably between a thousand two thousand emails and phone calls about problem with the trees tree pests and what something is wrong with my tree so um it's really we provide a broad range of the of the services to the to the albertans i always start with key messages folks um it's fall uh, we still don't have a snow uh, one of the things that you might consider is remove infested leaves from your trees if your trees don't have uh, any diseases whatsoever, don't remove the leaves. Leave them on the ground. They're extremely important to keep them on the ground. They provide a great insulation. They provide a great uh, nutrients for your roots and also home for lots of beneficial wildlife, uh, including the bees. But if you do have infested, such as with a, a fire blight or some other diseases, it's time to remove those leaves. If you keep them, that leaves, that spores that are in the leaves uh, will come back to your tree in the springtime and can spread your uh, infestation. So I'm going to mention some of the diseases that you might look into that. And if you have them, remove them. Otherwise, keep the leaves, don't remove them. Watering. That's the probably the most important thing you can do, guys, now. It's still, the uh, soil is not frozen. Uh, water them, water them slowly. is not friend of the trees and tree roots and in the long run can kill kill the trees but in, in any other case water your trees and we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about how to uh, water properly and how much each tree requires um, the second best investment right now if you can get it is the wood chips and the mulch trees and if you if you right now don't have a wood chips put the wood chips and then water over the wood chips and that water is going to slow go into the root zone and freeze and basically protect your roots. Um, don't fertilize. To lots of problems and eventually can kill the tree. Uh, sorry, Toja, I uh, just need to interrupt. I think you froze up on us a little before you started talking about the fertilizer. Can you just repeat that again? Okay, yeah. Okay, no problem at all. Uh, don't fertilize your trees. 
at all. I can, yeah, don't fertilize it now. Um, again, don't fertilize your trees uh, because uh, it's not going to be any benefits to the, the trees. With the soil disturbance and root and trunk damages, be extremely careful. Don't do the soil disturbance. Don't damage the roots. Don't damage the trunk. Because what happening if you open the damage now, the cold is going to come in, especially in the root zone. Yeah. And and will uh, it will create lots of problem for your trees. Don't do, do any pruning whatsoever uh, unless you have a broken branches and that. Uh, I know one of you, Carol, and the other person asked me, you can if you have a one or two little twigs to prune, you can do it. But overall, don't try to do any major pruning, nothing, unless it's a matter of safety. If you see that your your tree has a big crack or hanging branch and posing the matter of safety to yourself or equipment or power lines, uh, make sure that you deal with that. Um, with this uh, newly planted, uh, especially fruit trees, if you planted this spring or last uh, last spring or last fall, or if you plant the trees uh, this fall, especially fruits, you might install what we call plastic guard. And that will protect your young tree bark because what's happening, the sun is going to warm the bark and bark young, uh, very smooth, thin bark will crack and that will open the wounds for some of the really deadly diseases and can kill can kill your fruit trees. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how this look like. Prepare for wildlife damages. Um, it's uh, You can't avoid them. If you have a moose, deer, elk, um, uh, rabbits, uh, walls, uh, they will damage your trees. Um, there is a few things you can do it, but overall, that's also part of the of mother nature and uh, having the wildlife. You, it's a long ongoing. Uh, that snow might, you know, fell off, and and the, all of the soil you might end up in your in your uh, on your trees and around the trees, and that can damage um, livestock. If you do have any livestock right now, I would probably ask you to remove it for a couple of maybe until the first first freezing happening, and once it's frozen, you might bring the livestock because what's happening? It's uh, manure of the of the livestock is nothing but the fertilizer. It's urea, and that will can create a damage that not trees to sh properly shut uh, shut down um, also livestock to create lots of soil compaction which is extremely damaging to the roots of this uh, to the roots so if you can av avoid having the livestock especially on the younger trees that would be very beneficial for the trees um, I'm going to also tonight a little bit talk about full tree planting as well, if you still want to plant the trees, it's still good to plant the trees. You're going to plant the caliper, bigger trees. And I'm going to talk about that and uh, and how you're going to do that. So if you can buy the trees, you know, uh, with a burlap and basket or, or, or potted, it's still not late. Like most of my uh, folks in tree nursery and landscape, they are planting tree like crazy now, and 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 it's one of the also good time to plant the big caliper trees. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that as well. Um, impact of the trees in the fall and winter, uh, of course, lack of moisture, soil moisture. Generally speaking, um, we are always have a deficiency in the moisture in the fall, and that creates lots of cracks in the soil. And that's where the sometimes again that's where the cold air comes in and damage the roots. Insects and disease in the fall, generally speaking, they don't they should have been gone and it's for sure it's gone. What you might do now is to check if you had some of the diseases, or you also might check for some of the insect damage that was happened during the growing season that you might not noticing, especially some of the wood boring insects. You might just do the inspection. You 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 might notice, oh my God, I have a, I have a, this, this several insects that I didn't notice during the growing season. Uh, so you do the much more surveillance and inspection uh, during the winter time because you can see it. It's better to see it. There is no leaves. There is no uh, green around. Of course, cold at winter temperature and dry air is definitely very hard on the trees. Um, with the sun, uh, sun sclad and winter burn, every year, I probably 30% of the trees that got 
damage or killed uh, is with, uh, between those two, Sunsclad and Winterburn. There is a few things you can do it. One of them is watering. Uh, the second one is the is they also put the wood chips to protect the roots. If you have a healthy roots, you have a better chance to have a healthy above ground. Um, what is the also one of the challenges in the trees in wintertime, sudden warm weather. In last many years, especially last five years, we go from minus 40 in November 1st, and then in January 10th, we got plus 15. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is, is I do the cross country skiing and downhill skiing, and, and we got those weather, and that is horrendous stress to the trees. Trees uh, start thawing, and then again, heavy cold comes in, and that again, that's other 40% of the trees that got killed is that sudden warm and weather and cold and warm and cold and and it's it's a it's very common especially fruit trees in the last five years been hammered by this sudden warm weather that we got in january february and march salt and sodium products and the heavy snow you know we so far the trees are you know already should shut down but in the springtime uh we might get a warm weather and the trees start growing and then suddenly you get a heavy snow and that can damage the trees and uh, broke branches and and really create lots of lots of uh, headache uh, for you and and you have to deal with that in that sense. So be prepared much more for the heavy snow somewhere in April May than what we might have now. Now trees are shut down and heavy snow might not might not damage as much. Ice, on the other hand, it's definitely can be a problem. If we get in again in January, in I remember four years ago in Edmonton, or three years ago, it was like a skating rink. It was a freezing rain that was happening. And uh, and if you guys remember way back in Quebec in 1990s, uh, 1999, I think, that they got a freezing rain and completely devastating lots of trees in Quebec and Ontario and also power lines. Um, so the ice, if we get it thawing in January, February or March, and we get the freezing rain, they can stay on the trees and they can then make lots of damages. So those are some of the most common damages that you might experience in the in the fall and winter time. Come to the insects, most of the insects are gone. Said that um, uh, you might have a, some of the some of the spider mites that you might look into that. If you have a spruce trees uh, and you still have a spider mites, when you water the trees uh, uh, for the uh, for the winter, you might also water over the trees and try to get knocked knock the spider mites. It's much more come to the insects. It's really once the leaves are fell off, you would be able to see. Do you see any boring holes? Do you see the sawdust? Do you see the uh, any any damage by the insects? It's as I said, it's much more surveillance. We'd come to diseases, uh, leaves are fell off. You might take a look in the leaves, fallen leaves, and you can see, do they have a spores? Do they have a mold? Uh, and what kind of diseases that much you might have? And based on that, you might say, decide, do I rake or yeah, I don't rake? And, or do I keep or not keep uh, fallen leaves? Uh, and again, in winter time, uh, you will have, a, if you have a porcupine, rabbits, deer, moose, wolves, they will go after your trees. Um, and again, try to, uh, try to work to, to reduce or minimize uh, wildlife damage. As I said, the spider mites should be there. I, I'll check my trees that has a spider mites in, in September. And I check the end of the September, they were still there. And I didn't check one, you know, I was on holidays, but I didn't check them now. They might be there. Um, the best way you do, you take a sheet of white paper and uh, and uh, and and just take a, like a sheet of paper like and just shake it. And you're going to see if something fell down and they go like crazy zooming, zooming around. They are usually black or red color or yellow. Uh, you might have a spider mites and you might, again, you heavy rain soak them might reduce the spider mite damage um, in that sense. And again, they might reduce the spider mite uh, amount uh, come, to, come to the springtime. Mountain pine beetle, I don't think so that you do still have in your county said that it's not far away. I know there is in Stratcona County. I know there is in Camrose County, the Vataskan County. Uh, I think also, I'm not sure in Lamont. So 
if you have a pine trees, again, you might go and inspect. This is a typical uh, pitch tubes that you see it on your pine trees. And it's a mountain pine beetle. They are very deadly and uh, they are marching east. Uh, last two or three winters really reduced the uh, uh, amount of pine beetle in overall in Alberta because of the cold winter. But again, they are marching east. And I've seen some of like this place was in Torsby and the person has 180 pine trees. They got infested and he had to cut all of them and basically uh, whole his property was suddenly open he only had the one row one row of the tree so inspect for that um uh the vataskan county provide the mount pine mount pine villa pouches it's like a uh a, a verberone a pheromone that is try to detract the mount pine beetle and uh, not to land on your trees the results of this verberone is mixed sometimes it does work 70 80 percent sometimes it doesn't but at least that's the only thing you can do, but do the same inspection. If you find the one tree, try to remove it and burn it and don't keep it because they will, if you keep them during the winter time, next spring, uh, next year, they're going to fly to the, uh, fly to the next, uh, to the next tree. So if you see it, remove it, burn it. Um, needle cast, it's been in your county for a long time and not just your, but all uh, over Alberta. Uh, it's the mostly in coniferous and you can if you can see the little tiny black like a pepper uh, dots uh, uh, there. Generally speaking, this goes on pine and spruce, but generally speaking, it's never ever killed the trees. Your tree looks like much more naked. And inside, they usually attack the uh, older older needles, two, three, four, five years old. And this is a new growth needle. So if you look in your trees and you might see something like this, you might have a needle cast. Um, if you have a dead branches, yeah, you might remove it. As I said, overall, it doesn't kill the tree. It's just make look your spruce and pine completely kind of like I call like a naked. And you can see through the trees, which is in normal circumstances, you don't. Um, and again, there is a, some of the fungicides, but if, unless you're in a tree nursery business, uh, that fungicide is pretty expensive and you need to apply like a five, six times. It's pretty expensive. And you, uh, as I said, most of people cannot afford that. Um, and but again, it's a good thing that you know they exist uh, and and, you know, it, uh, uh, if it's really, really bad, then you might start thinking of replacing this, uh, some of those the trees. But again, overall, it's it's very rarely killed the trees. This one is Citospora. You do have that as well. Uh, it goes both on coniferous or, and, the, and the hardwood species. This is what happening on the left corner here. It was a fruit tree and, uh, and uh, sunsclad cracked the bark. Uh, and it's usually southwest and southeast parts of the tree that bark cracked because of the freeze and toe in winter time. And then this fungi comes in and basically kill these fruit trees. Uh, this is happening on the poplar trees. And I know in your county, you do have them. If you see it, if you have a, too many of them, you might need to remove them. If you have on the coniferous trees that, uh, uh, you know, you see the whole branch is like this, completely dead. As you can see, some of the green, some of the dead here. Uh, if you prune uh, prune them, again, you can do that in winter time, no problem at all, and, uh, and try to remove and burn it. Uh, if you do that early in the spring, be careful, you might pruning, we might spread uh, some of the diseases. So, but this one is much more prevalent and it is deadly. I, I have to admit that I've seen a lots of trees that over the years, especially younger trees get killed by this, by this canker. And again, uh, um, can go after the hardwoods and, and, uh, and the softwoods. Poplar leaf spots, again on the poplars, uh, if you see the, something like this and if you take your leaves, you know, that are fallen and you see the, like a, this blackish color in, in the, we call the spots, you might have this one. And this is again, symptoms of the disease. Uh, remove, the, remove the leaves. Don't keep them on the ground. If you keep them on the ground, they might come back and eventually can kill your trees. And they go after the hybrid poplars and balsam poplars as well. Uh, bronze leaf disease. Uh, usually the leaves get in August like this. 
and September, and it's sometimes have this green wind that is really significant and stay like this actually for a long time. Many times this leaves stays on the trees that are infested. Um, and it is over the three or four years, it can completely kill your uh, uh, Swedish aspen and towering poplars if you have them. The biggest mistakes people do, they plant all of the Swedish aspen in one row. And and so my message to you, don't plant one species, plant as many as different tree and subspecies. Because if you, in this particular case, they got sweet, uh, bronze leaf disease, all of the aspen got killed within a three or four years. Um, and again, don't chip it, don't compose it uh, or burn. If you see it and now, when it's you, you get the leaves, burn them, uh, and try to save the trees. And again, try to diversify your shelter, but don't plant plant too many Swedish aspen and and uh, poplar trees. Uh, Melanspora leaf rust. This was in Stettler actually, and you can see them again. They they are really yellowish color powder. And when I was there, that was of course in when was it in August I think, and you can see that it powdery. If you go now on the fallen leaves and you see that like a spores like a yellowish and powder, and sometimes you take a leaves and it's like a shake it and you see the powder, that's most likely might have a, this one. Um, not much you can do except again remove and destroy the fallen leaves is possible. And instead of keeping them in ground, if you keep them in the ground, they're going to come back and eventually start going to killing your, killing your tree. And again, avoid the monocultures. Fire blight is the other one. Uh, usually happen in July, June, July, August. And if you knew that you had a fire blight uh, this growing season, um, you definitely need to prune, not now, but probably uh, March. You know, now what you might do, you take a red tape or tape and mark the trees or branches that you need to remove it. And then when it gets colder, everything else then come and, and remove those uh, infested branches. Uh, they are very deadly. Like this one on the left is, uh, is, uh, is a mountain ash. It was uh, July 30th, I think, was completely green tree. I came on August or something like that, like a week later, completely brown. It's like somebody took a tiger torch and just blow blow over the tree and kill the tree. It's very deadly. Uh, and it goes after the apples, pears, hot tors, mountain ash, cotton aster. If you knew that you have this one, it's a bacteria, it's not even a disease. If you knew it's again if you have a leaves remove them burn them don't leave them there and then in the, in the later on in winter when it really freezes out do the pruning or like a, this apple if i know there's a several branches infested and you can see that why it's called fire blight you can see this blackish color around where it's infested uh that could be one of the symptoms that you got the fire blight so if i know i knew this apple had this and i took a, like a little red tape and I put around a couple of branches and the leaves fell off. I came and raked the leaves and then uh, probably February, March, come and prune this branch. And you have to probably go a foot below where the infestation might be or two feet at least. Um, uh, a foot at least, but preferably two feet as well. So this one is very deadly. And again, it, I hope you didn't have this growing season, but if you did, uh, be conscious and at least try to try to not not to spread, and don't keep them on the ground when you prune it and anything like that. Don't keep them on the ground; just dispose them and, and burn them. That's another thing I got uh, in the fall. And Nick, uh, I think and Matthew, you I got this fact sheets uh, bill for you. It's called fall needle drop, and you can see on this right picture you he see the here how the all of the yellowish color that's all the needles fell off. That's a very common uh, physiological process on the coniferous trees that every X amount of years, suddenly you, you they take 20% of the needles fell off uh, and all the needles. What you have to look for, you look at this for uniformity. It goes almost from the top all the way to the bottom. Most of the diseases don't do that. Diseases hit the one side here and one side there, and it's like a shotgun. This one with the fall needle drop, it's literally uniform from all the way to the top to the bottom. And it's 
nothing hurt the trees. Actually, it's in many ways it's beneficial, uh, and uh, I provide the nutrients, provide the habitat, to use the soil erosion in some aspects. Uh, but be aware of that. People really uh, this fall, I got uh, several many emails and phone calls. To wash my trees are something suddenly browning and and everything else. It's cold. And I look at it and it was a full needle drop. So again, the the the, the county has a uh, lots of fact sheets on, on all of the the topics and. Um, they have one of them. It's called full needle drop. So don't get don't get uh, uh, upset by this one. It's a normal normal physiological process for the for for the trees. Um, drought that we had in the uh, spring was cold and dry, and then certain parts of Alberta is really kept going dry. Twenty twenty two was also extremely full dry fall that you got a probably this spring you got a probably lots of tree that was suffering from the drought of the last year not from the from this year but for the last year and there's a many symptoms of the drought and i through my traveling i still see the lots of symptoms of the drought that we have the last couple of years um and again it's uh it's it's short precipitation sometimes what we also look we look the drought how much rain we didn't get it and uh, and you know that you see the leaves like this and and tree looks like this and just try to protect the core uh ends uh, ends are dying and uh, it's a reversible process um what what we also sometimes forget is the drought in the soil so we have a drought that is above the ground that we see the effect of the trees the most dangerous one is of course the drought in the soil and that's why the watering in the fall and dry fall is extremely important because uh, the soil, the roots of the tree is like an engine. If that is healthy, most of the time tree is going to recover and fight and try to survive. If your engine in, in, in that vehicle is not healthy, doesn't matter what is outside, uh, your vehicle is going to suffer. Same thing with the trees. If the roots are not healthy, your rest of the tree is going to suffer. And symptoms of drought are very hard. Uh, I mean, they can be very easily mixed with some other problems, with the herbicide damage, with the salt. They are very similar. And, uh, and, and there is a, some, you know, cupping and curling and rolling and leaves coach. Well, I have the same situation with the herbicide damage. Uh, I have uh, several clients who said to me, Tosha, I think this was a drought. And I said, no. And I, when I dig up further and inves investigate, it was a herbicide damage. Uh, so again, there is a lo lots of lots of times, you know, we, we misdiagnose and, and it's very hard to sometimes, but the drought symptoms are really wide spectrum of the trees. If you look this one, again, you can see this skinnish looking trees at the end of the dying. The, this something like this and you go in the leaves and they're going in a certain direction size and curling and capping there is a whole bunch of things but again it's it could be also misled by the other damage uh, salt and uh, and the herbicides which is very common uh, in one of the training on my arborist i put a picture of the damage by the drought damage by the herbicides and then by the salt and i have a room of 30 arborists only two of them got right because they it's very similar and if you if you don't do and do the proper investigation, you it's easily to mix. The impact of the of the of the drought, drought stress the trees, and then you got uh, insects who defoliate the trees. They sense it, they smell at trees, is weak, and then you got the wood borers, poplar borer, a bronze bee, birch borer, etc. Then you start getting sec a third phase. So the first phase is stressing. And then you get the defoliators. Then from the defoliated wood border, the third phase is the canker, and the fourth one is the root rot and, and this. And that's eventually how mm -hmm. a tree got killed. And it's, it's for some of the trees, the, the drought of 2021 and 2022, now and in the next three or two or three years, you you will go, we will noticing uh we will noticing uh death of the trees. It usually takes a two or three years or two, five years to get trees got killed, got killed. And the main cause is the drought. Many times people come to me and say, Tosha, I have a problem with the bugs. I have a problem with the diseases. But when I look the cause, the cause are not the bugs or disease. The cause is the drought. 
and that's where we go when the tree goes to spiral and, and, and dying. And it's 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 irreversible in many ways. And that's the other thing I mentioned is the dry soil. So the, 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 the roots of the trees is like a flat pancake. Roots of the trees, they live in, if you guys in Flagstaff County, you have a four or six inch top soil. That's what it, where is the 90% of the roots are. And they're flat. They don't go deep three, four, five, six feet. And maybe one or two species might have a go three feet that go that deep, uh, but only 5% of the roots. All of the roots, what you see is the is the is the on that top uh, four to six inch top soil. And when that dries out, that's where you start seeing the reduction in the roots that you start seeing the uh, above the ground start dying off. So uh, I mean, if this picture, if you look here, uh, like uh, this one, you can see where the branches are dead here. And that's because of the roots of this tree are dead. They already got killed. And that's why this you see this by the edges that they're, they're dead because of the roots. Roots simple cannot pump the water. And uh, and the roots, uh, then the, depending on the soil, if you have a heavy clay soil, uh, heavy clay, when it's drought, close the water, doesn't allow the roots to go in. And that's became water deficiency. If you have a sandy soil, the water completely drop down, then you don't have a, enough enough uh, uh, moisture in that as well. So the, 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 the one of the way to save your trees is again, pay attention to your soil and the moisture in the soil. Um, uh, well, again, uh, cracks. So what's happening in the fall, you dry fall, create the cracks. And the cracks, uh, cold air come into the cracks and go into the roots and the cold air literally freeze the water inside of the roots. And it's created like a little icicles. And in the springtime that when it's towing happened that ruptured and completely blapture the cells and rupture the basically roots. And that's the way it kill the trees. This is one of the very good example of the improper full tree planting that, that they did it. So they didn't remove the burlap. They kept all of the ropes, they planted too deep and you can see that you can see that where they came with the spade to plant this tree they left uh, they left this space this space here and all around and that's the way the cold layer come in and affect these trees and basically after two years tree tree was dead and again that's where the improper planting if you already planted properly everything else but you have a cracks and especially in the clay soil you have those big cracks, sometimes inch, sometimes half inch, depending what you what kind of soil and how much moisture. That's where the cold air comes in. When you put the wood chips and you water that over this, it's really close that gap, close the cracks, close the close the access of the cold air to the roots, uh, to the roots. And again, don't forget the roots of the trees are only four to six inch uh, on the top of the surface. Uh, compaction especially if you have a, a heavy equipment and livestock. And this was in Provincial Park, actually, in the Red Lodge, Provincial Park. And I was doing work over there. And the little path that barely was used. And you can see the amount of, uh, amount of uh, roots that you uh, have on the right side. Very little. And you literally, like a three or four inches, this is what natural soil it is. And look at the amount of roots and look at the amount of, you know, you, you don't see it, but I, when I went to inspect the amount of fine roots, and those little tiny roots that provide the moisture and nutrients. This is what compaction does. It squeezes, is literally squeezing the, uh, squeeze the, uh, the soil and doesn't let uh, enough uh, uh, room for the moisture and the air. And the roots of the trees need the moisture, moisture and the air. So that's what basically happened with compaction. If you have a livestock and nearby the trees, this is what happened. And that's become a cause for their tree to decline and, and going down the hill. A compaction is, especially our urban small towns and urban area is number one killer. Because the, the roots of the trees, when you take a soil, 40 or 50% is the soil. Other 50% is the open space where the water, roots, and air comes in. 
and that's if you squeeze that the simpler uh, thing the roots and uh, don't have a don't have a, a air and water so be that as i said be very sometimes careful with uh, your livestock especially with livestock around the trees fall wind uh, watering um what kind of soil you have if you have a clay or sandy soil, it's it's very important age of the trees. If you just planted the trees uh, and they are a few years old versus mature trees, all of them, they will require watering. But of course, uh, newly planted and a few years old require more. They require more attention. They require compared to the mature trees. Uh, you have a, a species that are loving the water, such as uh, willows and poplars and uh, elm and ash and maples many of them they are water loving species and then you have a pine and anything with thorns they don't like too much water they said don't give me too much water you're gonna drown me i'm not designed to handle lots of water um it's how much water you have and the quality uh is it available and how much sodium you have in 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 the in your water system and what time of day and month and you, you need to water now and cost don't you know that that does cost you to develop the watering system and time that you require to do that for the full watering test for the sodium levels if you have a high sodium levels and you water your trees eventually it will accumulate so much sodium in your soil that eventually is going to start killing your trees. Always plant the uh, younger one. Uh, they are highest priority and requires the most of the watering. One of the best way to check it is you, you take a screwdriver, six inch screwdriver and try to push down in the soil and then pull it out. And then you can see how much is more, how much soil is, is there on that metal parts of your screwdriver. If there's none of them, uh, definitely you need the watering. If you pull out and you see the wetness and you see the moisture, don't water. You don't need to water in that sense. Um, for one of the larger trees, the, the, the Americans spend quite a bit of money on it. They look in and say, they, this is a just rule of thumb, 10 gallons per inch of diameter. Um, they, this is, the, uh, as I said, Americans, I think, spent $30 million to really find out how much water the trees to come to the conclusion. Each tree, is, each site, it's so variable that they cannot really tell how much you need a watering. But they come up with, we call the rule of thumb, this is how much, um, uh, you you know, they said it's okay to water that much. But again, there's depending so many variables. Um, slow, slow, take your time. Don't rush um, and deep, slow and deep watering. Just trickle down right now as much and, and slow that the water is going to eventually penetrate in the, into deeper in the soil and be around the roots. Um, and mulch. Again, sometimes what you might do, you might put the mulch now and then you water slowly and then uh, that will that will definitely help. Um as again, Americans, again, <laughs> I talked to a fellow from Minnesota and he said to me, Tosha, we spent so much money. It was a, uh, it was a, you know, national wide project. This is just rule of thumb because it's each tree is different. Each soil is different. Uh, each weather condition on and on and on and on. And they simply say, this is just rule of thumb. It does. It's not in the stone they but this is how they it takes one and a half years for those trees that we planted to have root established one and a half years mm -hmm. wow. one and a half years that's correct bill uh, so depending what what how big trees you planted uh bill if you planted the caliper trees or you planted the small little trees so Again, it takes it takes a time when you plant the trees to get into the parent soil. No doubt about that. It takes the time, and this is a caliper trees because don't forget when you take a caliper trees when they sell you in the burlap and basket, they take eighty percent of the roots. What you used to be in nursery, and they put that in the, in the burlap and basket. So for to recover that, it takes a time, and I'm gonna show you in the tree planting guys about that. Uh, drip line, where to water? We call this a drip line. 
is where the furthest sides of the branches are, and we kind of draw a vertical line, this is where you start watering. And again, don't forget the uh, roots of the trees are like a flat pancake. Lots of people, what they do, they take the hose and put right away to trunk. And I, I said, that's the last place you water your trees. Because the roots around the trunks are thick, big. They don't have a fine roots. They, they are there for the stability of the trees. They're keeping the trees not fell down, basically. The roots further away, those are ones that take all of the nutrients. Those ones are that are that are taking all of the new, uh, water. So when you're watering the trees, again, we, we call this drip line. It Does, doesn't matter what size of the trees, you draw that, and this is where you start watering. And slow, don't rush. Okay, so again, just it's very important how you properly water your trees. Again, don't, and again, if you can, all around the trees. Don't just get in one side of the trees. This is where the roots are going to develop to, or go further or rather just go around and slowly, slowly try to water. Uh, for the fall mount, um, I strongly suggest to put the four to six inch. Uh, if you can put six, great. Four is definitely good. Uh, again, when you have a caliper trees, create we call donuts. Don't create a volcano, spread the chips. Uh, the reason why we create this space is because we don't want uh, moisture from the wood chips come to contact with the bark. There are several diseases that is going to uh, jump and really damage the bark, and we call this root collar, and they can kill the trees. Also for the rodents, if you pile up to lots of wood chips around the trunk, the rodent might live in this wood chip and start griddling your tree. When you have a, this opening, if they live here, for them to go in there, it's much more danger preposition from the weather-wise in that sense. Uh, and this, again, if, if you look this, like this spring, I was visiting several clients and it was very dry outside. The fires were aging and I went and checked the moisture in the, in the, in the wood chips after literally an inch. Uh, it was dry, but after that, after when I reached the four inch of the of the of the wood chips, it was still almost frozen, and that was end of the May. And the wood chips kept the moisture, kept the moisture, and he literally side by side, one of the tree he ran out of mulch, so one of the tree didn't have any wood chips, and one of them, uh, all other one had it, and that one that didn't have a wood chips got killed. And he said, oh, my God, now I can see it. So this one of the things is one of the best investment. Now, Nick and Matthew, I know you contacted me way back uh, that counties might think to provide the wood chips to the residents. I assume you guys are working on that project for the next spring. Uh, uh, but lots of counties and municipalities, they, uh, they might have wood chips. Uh, that you can take free of charge. I know City of Edmonton does. Uh, if you have a uh, fortress or other uh, arborist nearby area, they can, they will gladly come and dump the uh, wood chips for you, and then you can apply the wood chips to your to your trees and shrubs. Okay. And here is the um, again we call arborist wood chips. It's it's the best. Um, and and the, the again, if you can get there, get put you know four inches, preferably six, six, and that will last probably six, seven years, and then will start going down, and then you just replenish and mix them up and and uh, bring them back to the surface. Uh, the benefits, uh, it's the biggest thing is protecting the roots in our climate. It's protect the roots from cold air and winter freezing. And of course, there is a uh, provide the nutrients, uh, temperature, moderated temperature. Again, this uh, 2021 and 2022 and partially 2023 because of the drought. Anybody who has the wood chips is probably one of the key things that saved the trees. It was so dry. And that wood chips, uh, because it's keep the moisture for so long. Um, there is also, they act as a, a good weed control. 
as well, uh, uh, in, uh, enhanced infiltration of water and retention. So that there's so many benefits of the wood chips and we have plenty of them. Really in this country, we have lots of wood chips, like, you know, just fortress and, and utility companies. We are talking about thousands of tons that they do for the brush cutting for the, you know, control the, for the power lines. Um, and there is a arborist that do the pruning and removal of the trees. They have it. And again, some of the counties, municipalities, they do uh, establish the wood chips for, uh, available to the residents. So I, I think the Flagstaff County is working on that. Um, but again, I, I don't know enough information. I don't have enough information. Can you, information. Can you hear me? Yes, Nick. Go ahead. Yeah, so I can uh, I can talk a little bit on that. And we did get approved to set up three satellite mulch sites throughout our county. Um, we're planning to do that uh, this fall. Um, if not, it'll be early early next spring. Um, they'll be located in uh, one's going to be in Strom, one's going to be in Galahad, and then one's actually going to be in between our administrative building and our county shop. So. Um, we'll have, have three spread out throughout our county, and and basically we're we're trying to you know give free access to our our uh, our ratepayers um, for wood for wood chips, and also try and keep them out of the landfill too, right? So we're gonna be contacting um, some lo some local arborists, and actually the county's getting a wood chip or two um, as we start to deal with some of our trees in our hamlets and, and communities and parks. So um, yeah, excellent. I guess, yeah. We'll, we're hoping to have them uh, established here this spring and ready to go for next summer. Yep, now that that's ex that's excellent, excellent news. Okay, um, John, and can you talk about tree rings you can purchase? Are they, uh, educate me, John, if you can unmute. Uh, uh, what do you mean the tree rings? Um, you can buy those, uh, they're kind of a rubbery s substance and they're just a flat ring oh, okay. under the tree to kind of control weeds. Is there any point in those to go under the mulch? Personally, no, not at all. If you ask me, um, the, they will a little bit control the weeds, uh, but that's a very small portion of that. Uh, generally speaking, what's happening, they, because they're rubber mats, they don't infiltrate. When, when the water goes through, they don't allow the water to go deeper down compared to the wood chips. They don't provide any nutrients whatsoever. The only their purpose is the, is the weed control. Other than that, they don't really provide they provide some of the uh, moisture attention because again they don't let the water go evaporate when it's the dry but overall that's a really fraction of the benefits compared to the uh, wood chips strand thank you yep okay guys don't be shy ask question anytime okay okay where are we next animal damage well, you you will have a porcupines and uh, 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 you will have a woodpeckers. This is coming from woodpeckers, uh, porcupines uh, in some area, beaver, and of course deer and moose and everything else. Um, as I said, it's not much you can do. Uh, some people, of course, you know, if you have a beaver, they do the beaver control uh, with a porcupine. Uh, some people try to catch them and translocate somewhere else or shoot them uh, with a, with a, a small woodpeckers. Uh, really, not much, not much you can do. But they they definitely can. I have a several situations where the beaver alone killed probably uh, two acres of natural forest. Uh, porcupine killed probably hundreds of trees. So uh, if you don't pay attention, uh, they you might. You, they they can create a lots of damage, uh, especially porcupine, deer, moose, and and uh, definitely they can create a lots of damage. With the birds, with the small sapsuckers, it's very rarely I've seen the tree got got killed. I think in my career, twenty something years in Alberta, I've seen maybe five trees that I can say the main cause is from sapsucker. Generally speaking, they don't. Uh, again, we just talk about yellow-bellied subsuckers. Um, they, again, they will, uh, people will try to do lots of things to control and really none, none of them is effective, to be honest. Uh, one of the good thing about them, uh, if you like the birds, 
they provide a wonderful habitat for the hummingbirds. Uh, and because they do that, uh, they do, and it's a perfect habitat for the hummingbirds to uh, rely on the spring sap in that sense. As I said, overall, I've seen people taking two two by fours and clapping. I've seen the people put a, uh, like a speaker inside of the trees and, and put the birds of prey, try to scare them off. Um, they got, you know, effective for, for a while. And then after two or three months or month or whatever, birds doesn't care anymore what you do. They said, "Yeah, no, that doesn't endanger me in that sense." But again, it's it's a parts of the parts of the nature. This one is definitely more deadlier. Uh, they can really destroy, especially fruit trees, and especially those are trees that you water and fertilize and pamper. They just love it because the bark is uh, very uh, high in nutrients, very soft. And they will go and really damage, make a lots of damage. Um, control. Well, it's a hunting season. If you, if you <laughs> have a problem, it's uh, bow hunting is still on. And then November first is the hunting. Well, invite <laughs> invite your friends or you do the hunting. Um, I just talked to a friend of mine yesterday. Uh, he has a section of the land near Breton area. And it's so interesting. I know his property quite well. That now during the hunting, the moose and deer are literally in radius of 300 yards from his home. And they just circle around. And literally by December 1st, after December 1st, you don't see them. Yeah. But this time <laughs> they're literally <laughs> laying. And I was talking to Tosha, look this. And the moose was laying in the open field. And it's like, maybe 60 feet from, from house. So they, they're smart. They, they just try to protect, protect themselves. But again, um, electrical fencing is maybe one of the things that might help out if you can afford that. Uh, porcupines, again, people try to do the control. Um, uh, again, poisoning is illegal in, in Alberta. Uh, lots of people, you know, basically kill them. And if they see the lots of damage of the porcupine, some people try to trap them and, you know, send them somewhere else. Um, maybe that's option. But yeah, they they overall, um, in the they go usually on the bigger trees. And in your area, what was surprising to me, I've seen the several porcupine damage of the of the Manitoba maple, on the ash tree. Usually they make a damage on the coniferous and willows. But I've seen in your area and further south on elm, which I was for first time I've seen the porcupine go after the elm trees. It was Siberian elm, and then uh, ash and uh, Manitoba maple, which is quite unusual to be honest. But it's definitely can go after your after your trees. This little uh, wall. A uh, friend of mine, he he has a wonderful property and he put a lots of wood chips and he didn't make, uh, he put the wood chips right next to the shrubs. And this little wall, it was a perfect habitat. You can see how far the snow, as the snow was so deep this much and cover all the things, they were just climbing inside, eating as the snow dropping down. They were going down and eat and strip the bark and eventually kill the shrub. Uh, control. Tough one. He, the friend of mine, told me all kinds of stories how to control and chase this one. Um, it's a tough one. But said that, when he has this one, he also has uh, owls and birds of prey and many other uh, birds of prey that in his property because of the population of this little rodent. Winter kill and sunburn, very common, very very common things, especially. Uh, you guys start calling me somewhere in April, May, and June, uh, and it's usually happen on the southeast and southwest parts of the tree. Uh, trees are completely green in the fall, and then you get the completely brown. Like this cedar, it's my neighborhood, was completely 100% brown in 2016, and he wanted to cut. I did inspection. So when you come close and we see it in the spruce or, or cedar or pine, you look for the top bud, the bud that is on the top of the of the twig. And you guys break it and break 
and look inside. If it's green, this one is going to flush out and a new growth is going to happen. You can see here in this little spruce, I inspected uh, probably two weeks before and I told, uh, told actually it was city of St. Albert. I said, no, 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 it's fine. Uh, and they start new growth. All of this was killed. And all of this was killed. But Are you learning anything? Uh, well, a little bit. Like when you put that, was that wood mulch that you put around all the trees? Yeah. Okay, somebody is shelling and, a, and, and says, so that was good. And you didn't pack it up to the trees, right? Now yeah. I did. Oh, well, that's where the voles get in, he says. Okay. <laughs> they live in the winter and they can gnaw on the bark and stuff. He says, uh, you, you when you first planted them, you left. Matthew, can you? Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, okay, perfect. So come to this winter burn again, is always pay attention. If you come and take that little bud and it's crumble, that means it's dead. I always said to people, wait if you have a something like this and wait till probably, let's say July 1st. If nothing come out of after July 1st of this brownie uh, color, it's dead. Um, and again, it's what happening, it's usually in Southeast and Southwest, the uh, sun uh, in January, February, and March, hit the trees and the, the, the water start flowing in these little needles and start flowing and then during the night drop down and the next day again a little bit thawing and the water start flowing and then freezes and and that again um to again to protect overall trees water them early in the late in the fall and early in the spring uh, if you if your trees got really uh, hammered by the winter burn, but still alive, fertilize them. Provide them a lot, quite with nitrogen and potassium in the springtime. So whatever April, May, June, half of the July, make sure that they got some fertilizer because nitrogen is going to get the new growth more, uh, more, uh, more grow which means more photosynthesis, which means more sugar for the roots in that sense. So, but water them, water them now. And again, if you put them in the wood chips, put them in the wood chips now and water them. And then in the springtime, if you got this, um, then um, then again, uh, water them and put the fertilizer. Uh, lots of people even today, somebody was asking to put a burlap around the trees. Uh, like uh, around the small tree, no, that doesn't doesn't help at all. Lots of people try to do and protect, you know, small trees, and no, it doesn't doesn't help with the winter kill. Winter dieback is also common. Uh, this was a birch. I have a in my backyard. I have a, a silver maple. Every year grows like crazy, and then every spring I got sick like this, fifty percent. It's still alive trees and it's probably 40 feet tall. Every year I have to prune and I use for my fire pit. Uh, so it's sometimes this has happened when you've got to plant the trees that are we call uh, hardiness zone four or five and, uh, and the winter comes and the tree don't shut down now. They're still growing and then the frost come in and, and start killing the twigs. Uh, as I said, my, my silver maple is 30 feet tall and probably uh, six, inch, 6 inch diameter. But every year I have a 30% of the last year growth completely dead. And I prune. Um, it's a just choice of the trees that we that is not adaptable to this climate. But I don't mind. I don't mind to prune them. I don't mind them uh, to have that. But I love that, love that tree. So uh, again, fertilize in, in the spring and prune them in the spring. And most of them should be okay. Uh, salt injury, this is very common, uh, very deadly. And the salt kills two ways. This is uh, uh, along the major uh, arteries in Edmonton. And the salt, uh, they, when they, they, they go, you know, uh, use the salt and it's end up on the, on the trees, it's literally burn. Uh, but the more danger is uh, the sodium end up in the soil. And uh, over the years, uh, roots of the trees accumulate enough sodium in the, into the tree, and then it shut down and basically kill the trees. So the, it's a it's a long lasting effect. Same thing if you water this tree, 
uh, and that you have a high sodium levels, eventually you're going to accumulate em enough sodium in your soil and that will kill the trees and create a problem for down the road to replace the tree. So be very, very careful with the sodium. Uh, same thing, you know, against this is city of Edmonton, uh, accumulation of the, of the of the snow with the full of sodium, with the newly planted trees. I think the mortality of this tree along this road is probably 30% after two years and mostly tied to the sodium and compaction partially, but sodium. Um, there's all kinds of sodium, uh, uh, chemical, uh, sodium products that we sometimes we are not not even aware. Uh, we used guys in Alberta uh, seven tons of salt per one mile of road. If you have a major highway, highway 13, 14 in your area or secondary highway 861 or whatever you, you guys have, uh, they use the seven tons of sodium. That sodium eventually end up in our ditches, eventually end up in our wetlands, and unfortunately end up uh, for the roots of the trees to uh, around the roots of the trees and the roots of the tree absorb. One of the message uh, for you guys with the sodium never ever if you know that your major highway use and the lots of sodium never ever plant a spruce tree. They are notoriously susceptible to the salt damage. Every other tree is also very susceptible, but the spruce by far is very susceptible. So there is a fact sheet, I think Nick and Matthew has it, that I built what trees are salt tolerant more than others. Uh, sea buckthorn, for example. If you have a major highway, put a sea buckthorn, put a, a, a juniper or some other, they will, they will take a beating of the sodium and then put the spruce way further away from them. So there is a list of the of the salt tolerant species that I know the county has it, or I send them send them information. Uh, Sunsclad, as we called, um, uh, is again we usually again sudden dramatic changes in the temperature in winter time usually in south south east, uh, and it's cracked the bark like here, and that's open the wounds and the, uh, and then. Uh, uh, most likely Cytospora canker or gamosis and in the fruit trees, they come in and they start killing your trees. Um, again, there is a, all kind of cherries, you know, susceptible, but all the trees, once the bark became much harder and, and thicker, they, they don't, they create a cracks, which is completely different than bark, bark splitting. And, and, and when it's bark split, it's much easier to get uh, 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 diseases. Uh, all of the fruit trees are very susceptible. Now, you see on the bottom picture uh, here, guys, this like a plastic mulch, we call the tree plastic guard. It's a perfect time for you now, if you have a few fruit trees to buy that. It it's, could be just in the... Uh, strip and then put them now and then in April take it out don't keep year round no put them now and then in April for sure take them out and then next fall again put them, put them again that will save you these cracks because sun is going to hit that plastic and it's going to reflect and it's not going to uh, hit a, a young and thin bark and again don't choose the burlap it, it really doesn't help uh, back in old country, what you used to hear, uh, we used to back in Europe, and I haven't seen here in Can in Alberta. I think I've seen somewhere in BC that people use the uh, latex painting, and they paint in white the the trunk of the tree, and uh, and that that will also uh, protect from the from the sunscreen. But the best thing if you can put a plastic plastic guard. Uh, protection of the trees, again, from animals and, um, again, in wildlife, it's the electrical fence, uh, having the summer. I have in my uh, Evans cherry, uh, I have, we have a lots of rabbits here in north parts of Edmonton, and they come and they try to eat the bark of my Evans cherry, and I just put a chicken wire around all the way to the first branches, and sometimes I see the uh, rabbits come on top of the snow, 
and I just dig up a couple of showers that they can get inside and and not to reach my my this. So uh, for the rabbits and uh, this works very very well. And it's, and some of the probably for the deer, uh, they're not gonna damage at least bark. They might uh, damage the uh, branches, but uh, it's not gonna damage the bark of the trunk of the tree. And this one is also what the person did. They tried to protect entirely from the deer, uh, but also prepare for the winter time. Uh, fall tree planting, very common practice. Uh, if you want to buy some potted or caliper trees, uh, people plant all the way until soil is frozen. Uh, the key thing is proper planting and mulching is must. Of course, trees are more expensive than, than the small little seedlings. Um, and you can have a choice between the burlap and basket. You want to plant the trees, you can you have a choice. Now, uh, again, don't forget the roots of the trees are very flat. And, and this is a prime example. Uh, work with your soil. This is a, a natural soil al along the lake. And when I was inspecting, and you have a big trees over there, not a single root goes uh, more than a foot deep. There is no roots here. Nothing. All the roots are in this nice topsoil. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is if you live in a, in your soil that is a heavily compacted, well, I live in, in Edmonton, and you see the clay, heavy compacted soil, and you only have, especially this is a common in new development, where they're building a new houses and everything else, and you have like a, this two inch, like a two inch top soil, and that's it. The rest of it is compacted soil. There's a little bit better soil, which is a four to six inch, and then this one is six to 12 inch. Because don't forget, Forget compaction is incredible killer. Doesn't let the roots to grow, to spread, to get oxygen, to get the water. So prior you plant, make sure that you plant this caliper tree is, that is not in compact soil. If you have a compact soil, you might wait and wait for next spring and do the, something about compaction and then you plant the trees. Pay attention for the, especially now in the fall, if you want to plant the trees, where you're putting the trees. Uh, uh, do the soil test for the nutrients if you fi figure out if you have any deficiency uh, in nitrogen or potassium and again it's $60 cost and do the some testing it, it will tell you what kind of what kind of soil you have um, I always call this uh, people buy a $500 tree and they put in the five cents hole and, uh, and and it's a very common mistake especially people buy potted trees and they literally dig up the hole around the pot, pull out the trees out of the pot and put in the hole. And that's one of the number one killer is improper planting. So the rule of thumb is uh, if you buy the potted trees, dig up the hole that is two or three times wider uh, than the pot itself. And make it as a shallow, like a little shallow sauce, saucer that shallow dish, and uh, and that's that's the way you you can you can uh, you can plant. I'm gonna a little bit uh, 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 tell you about how how to do that. Um, well, I asked this question, you know, people the choice when you buy the burlap in basket, folks. You this tree grow in nursery, perfectly fine. Have a roots, spread the roots. And then they come with a, with a spade and they cut 75 to 80% of the roots. They put in burlap and basket and they sell it. Versus the trees in the pot, you don't do any root, root, root reduction. So what the picture of dry say, even though these trees are way smaller than this one, but after the five years, the small trees completely outcompete the big one. Because it takes a time for these roots to develop, to come back to the original state. And the, all of the energy that we are spending is try to recover the roots that they get lost by cutting by the spade. Compared to this one, it's right away to grow. And they start growing faster. That's why the tree became bigger. 
to give you an example, guys, this is lady uh, Nina Basuk from uh, Cornell University. Same tree, this is what she did. Same tree, same soil, same everything. On the right, this is how much roots you have when you don't use the spade. You, this is what she dig up with the air, spade, air, air and clean up and say, look at how much roots. And then you come with the spade and this is how much root roots you get you get when when you use the spade so for the trees in the first five years they try to recover this loss of the roots they, they spend all of the energy to recover because what happened here above the ground you have a branches you have a leaves and above ground is a sugar factory so that the, the photosynthesis provide a sugar to the roots what happened when you cut you still have a same amount of branches, same amount of leaves, but you don't have a same amount of roots. And the roots cannot provide the nutrients and water as much. That's why in this picture, even though those trees are way bigger, but after five years, small trees way out compete the bigger one. And that's why sometimes you see that mortality. They, they tell you, oh, we're gonna guarantee you for a year uh, but after you know tree is going to survive for sure for a year but after that they will might not grow as fast as the as the younger uh, as the smaller stock so be be conscious on that when you plant the trees again dig the hole that is under the slope shallow and it's a two or three times wider than what uh, what the stock you plant if you have a pot and uh potted trees Again, the bigger the soil you have, sometimes if you plant the many trees, the best thing you can do, you take the tractor, take the disc and whole strip. You do the proper site, uh, soil site preparation, and then you dig up the hole and plant the trees. If you just do the one in your backyard, again, do the three or, uh, three or four times uh, wider hole and then you plant the tree. Uh, again, planting hole, the next thing you have to pay attention is called root color. That is the where the roots begins and trunk begins. We call the uh, root flare or root collar. You never ever bury this into the soil. This, if you look in natural trees, anywhere in the forest, you will always see above ground where the roots begins and where the trunk begins. Always. They were never ever buried in, in, in the soil. And lots of people plant way too deep. This one, what I do, you take a two by four across this hole and I find where is this? And I put this tree over there that is exactly in the two by four across. So when I plant my tree, this we call root collar is literally an inch above, uh, sorry, uh, maybe a quarter inch above, uh, above my soil or maybe quarter inch just below. But lots of people plant the trees way too deep. And then um, uh, again, look at the how big hole he did. Uh, uh, if you take a two by four across, this is where the root color is. And then you do the back film. Lots of people ask me, Tosha, should I put a good soil? No. You might take a 10% of the good soil, but whatever you do, you take this soil mixed up with the good soil and then you do the back film. Don't you ever take like in this situation or here, what people do, they pull out and then they fill up with all of the good soil. If you do that, the roots of this tree or this tree will never ever leave this hole. They're always gonna stay in the good soil. Your goal when you plant the trees is to get the roots as soon as possible to your parent soil, to here. That's what is your goal of planting. Once they go into the parent soil, you're gonna have a long-term survival. If you put a good soil here, they will spin around and circle, circle eventually. In the long run, they're gonna get killed. Then you do the backfilling. You can see that where is the root collar, and then you do the mulching, and then water. It is a very common mistake. Plant it way too deep. This was a project, I think, hundred thirty thousand dollars that they reject. This person planted probably a foot, foot and a half almost deep, this tree. Same thing here. There is no root flare. You don't see it. It's buried. 
And that, that, that we call root flare or, or root collar, if you bury that inside, so all of the small fine roots are way deep in the clay soil. And on top of that, if this is not above the ground, the fungi develops around this here where it's, you know, lots of soil and eventually kill the tree. So do not bury your tree. This is way to bury the trees. Very common mistake. This person literally did, uh, took a, 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 a the, the, from the um, from the from the store, come up with uh, 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 over there, draw the line where it's going to dig up the hole, pull the tree out, and put over there for uh, foot and a half, and all the trees uh, uh, were rejected. And this is what happened: you planted too deep. So when when this person said to same place he was questioning me why you are rejecting my trees i said this is why you plant them too deep and this is basically how you kill your trees oh he was not happy about his contractor with whatsoever um mulching i think we talk about that create a donuts not a volcano in nutshell water we talk about that uh, water them, make sure that you water, make sure that you cracks when you dig up with the spade that are filled, they're closed. That's why two or three times bigger will avoid the, uh, avoid that space. When people come with the spade, they dig up the soil and they take the uh, tree, caliper tree, and put back. But you're always going to have one eighth of the, or one four quarter of the, that is going to be a space. And you're never going to be able to fill that up. Versus you take a two times size of the of the uh, of the burlap and basket, you have a lots of room that you can park, you can backfill properly, and not leave the crack when I show you in the previous in the previous picture. Don't fertilize whatsoever, um, and again be always careful around the roots and and uh, and uh, and the trunk. Uh, don't prune whatsoever. Now it's not time to prune. If you have a broken or something like that, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but don't do the major pruning whatsoever. And in the, now in the winter time, you have lots of deadfall. It's you might do the cleanup operation to reduce the potential of fire in the springtime. Lots of shelterables, they have lots of deadfall, folks. And this spring, all of the fires in the West, I can tell you this. Uh, started by the people, not all of them, but uh, uh, main cause was human. It was very cold, but very dry. So lighting did not create those fire in the West in April and May. It was people. And in some of the shelter belts, people are doing the cleaning up the yards and getting the trees and getting the shelter belts and spreading the fire. So now in winter time, what you might do to for the fire and I can, you know, I have a complete presentation of the, of, about uh, Fire Smart, uh, but it's winter time. It's a perfect time to that you do the cleanup with the lots of dead material, and remove them and try to reduce the potential for the fire. Uh, the reason needs to be for pruning. I said today, one lady from Orava, oh, Tosh, I need to prune my tree. She says, why? You have to have a reason. Number one reason is safety. Number two is the uh, health of the trees, insects and diseases. And if you have a fruit trees, you can do for the uh, fruit production. Otherwise, there is no need to prune the tree. Never prune the trees for the sake of pruning. It's always stressful to the trees. Always. So prune when you only need to. And again, only reason is safety. One of the biggest ones is safety. Do the proper cuts. This is what we call three-way cuts. Pay attention. Um, I think we next spring we're going to have a whole session on the pruning, folks. So just this is just bits. Pay attention to this. We call uh, branch collar. You never ever damage that swelling. This is a branch collar. This is where the where, where the uh, 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 branch begins. This is a, where is the main trunk. And there is a special tissue in this branch collar that heal the wounds. That's why we never use any more painting and. Uh, 
putting any spray on the wounds, nothing. Do the proper pruning. And the proper pruning is relatively simple. You do the first undercut. The second cut is you take the weight off. And we call this a stub from blue to green. Don't leave that and make, you have a little, little stub and make a final cut if you need to prune. But again, we will have a session in the spring on the tree pruning and many other things. Um, again, I'm going to go back to always begin with, if you have a lots of leaves and they are not infested, keep them. They're perfect mulch. They're perfect recycling for the nutrients. They're perfect for lots of beneficial insects. They're, they're really beneficial. If you have infested, remove it and burn it or, or dispose it. Water the trees. It's still not late. I don't think so. We're going to get a deep freeze probably next week or so. Water them properly. Remember the drip line, how you do it. Test your water. The best thing you can do is you, you still can do it is put the wood chips and then water. That's that's one of the best way you can do it right now. Don't fertilize. Don't try to disturb any soil. Try, don't try to damage the roots and trunk and anything like that. Doing that, it's it could be very deadly. Prune only if it's broken and it's a matter of fire hazards, lots of dead branches, uh, that something can really make a damage. But otherwise, don't prune unless, unless you have some of those situations. If you have a young uh, fruit trees that you just planted or two years ago and the bark is soft and smooth and thin, put the plastic guard and, and try to protect that bark from the sun sclat. You will have a wildlife damages. There is no magic bullet there. You have to deal with that. Uh, if Watch out for the salt. Not to bring lots of salt, test your water for the salt. Not you don't contribute to the speed up of the of the killing of the tree by the sodium. If you can try to remove the livestock right now, uh, because they are new manure is nothing but the nutrients and can confuse the tree and uh, and really tree doesn't shut down, and also soil compaction. Uh, Matthew, Nick, and everybody here. I don't know. You guys jump in in the questions, comments, whatever you have. Hello. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions or anything, uh, just thank you, Toja, for that presentation and all that information. Uh, thanks for everybody that joined in too. I uh, just want to remind everyone again that this was recorded and will be put on our social media so you can watch it again if you want. And if anyone has any questions in the future, don't uh, hesitate to question me or Nick, get into contact with us and we can relay uh, your questions to Toja. So, but yeah, after... Okay, hold on. Uh, I have a day, day mean, and you can put on much to keep the dogs off. Well... I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think so. The, nothing you can do. Nothing you can do about dogs about that. They will go probably over mulch. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Hey, I just like to uh, bring some awareness to our shelter belt establishment program too. Uh, this is a really great program if you want to get cheap, cheap seedlings um, in the ground. Uh, the applications are live right now. You can. You can access them through our county website if you go under uh, county services and under the agricultural service board. There's there's more information on on that page there. And uh, of course, if that doesn't work for you, just come on into the office or give myself or Matthew a call and, and we can get you guys set up with that program. Um, our, our supplier is Tree Time. So if you go under their website, treetime.ca, if it's on their website, we can get it. Um, there is a 50% subsidy for landowners in Flagstaff County. So not only do you get the benefit of bulk order pricing on trees, uh, but if you're located in the county and the taxpayer, you actually get uh, half the cost covered for those trees. Um, and I'll also mention that uh, last year we created a tree list. So we can get coniferous, deciduous, and shrubs, but we can also get ornamentals too. Um, so if you, if you reference our... We reference our application there. Um, the specialty order trees, uh, they aren't, um, they don't include the 50% subsidy. 
Um, however, we can still bulk them up and get you some some good discounts uh, for those trees. So typically the ornamentals, but uh, yeah, if you reference our our uh, shelter belt application form, um, there's more information on that. And as always, if you guys have any questions, uh, just reach out to me or Matthew. We uh, we contract with Toja for his services, so um, we can lean on him for for certain questions that if, that we don't necessarily know. So, um, yeah, thanks again, Toja. It's always a pleasure. Uh, Joanne, uh, yes, uh, I was gonna be sorry, uh, sorry, Nick. Uh, Joanne, uh, can I people attend uh, the webinar? Get the three fact sheets that Toja. I think Nick and Matt. You have got all of my fact sheets, and uh, you whatever fact contact them, and they will send it to you. I, I there is a gazillion of fact sheets. Just contact Nick and Matthew, and look, ask what you're looking for, and they will send it to you. They have it. Yeah, that's yeah. right, Toja. Um, I have a fifteen fruit trees. Is there anything else they require? Uh, Rose. May I ask you uh, how old they are? When did you plant them? Can you un unmute yourself, Rose? Or whoever is under the name of Rose? Hmm. Maybe she's typing. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Rose. Uh oh, okay, Cheryl. Uh, uh with the fire blight after freeze up. After really they freeze up, uh you prune do the pruning. Don't because even though it's it's still a trees are shut down, but it's still alive. Uh but when it's uh February or whatever, really when it's freeze up, you know where they are, yeah, prune them. Absolutely prune them. And and again, don't leave them there. Dispose them one way or another. Um, Rose, again, I I wish to answer your question. I don't know what you are asking. I don't know. I need more information to answer your question, Rose. I think we had a hand up too, Toja. Uh, okay. Shelley had a hand up. Uh, if you want to, okay, unmute. go ahead. I think I answered her Sorry. question. Sorry, guys, I accidentally hit that button. I've been really enjoying the presentation. <laughs> okay. No problem. Thank, thank you, Shelley. Um, um, yes, uh, again, if anything else I can do, guys, let me know. Um, let Nick Nick, and Matt, you know, and they will always contact me, and then you can, you can contact as well. But uh, I really want to thank to the county to having me, and I hope it was worthwhile for you guys. Yes, definitely. Thanks a lot, Toja, yeah. for me. and. Uh, thanks everybody again who joined and we'll have this again all on our social yeah, media. I think we're planning on, we're, we're, we're probably, sorry, Matt, I just want to pipe in here again. Okay. I think we're planning on having Toja back in the spring. So as long as, as long as our, uh, our residents are keep attending that spring workshop, we'll, we'll keep her going. So look <laughs> forward to that as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We will have, we will have something in springtime. Okay, guys have a good evening and thank you everybody.